Let's take our Bibles for our scripture reading and look together in James chapter 4. This is a great chapter to read in light of our study in 2 Samuel chapter 13 where we see all kinds of conniving, striving, scheming going on and Sometimes when you read some of those Old Testament portions of Scripture, you wonder, where is God? God is on the throne, and he's doing exactly what he purposed should be done. He is the God who does his will both in heaven and on earth. And yet we acknowledge rather readily that all of these things as far as sin and fightings and wars, they come from within. And here in James chapter 4, we have that specific statement made here. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? And so... Here we see this matter of wars and strivings and fightings of men. It is attributed to what is within each of us. And that is because of who we are in our sin nature, who we are in our father Adam. And it says, ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Now what is of interest here is that this is being written to those who professed to be the Lord's. You say, well, how can that be? Well, again, wherever you have sinners gathered together, there's going to be strivings, there's going to be fighting, there's going to be devourings among those that are left to their own lusts and to their desires. When it says ye kill and desire to have, it doesn't necessarily even mean killing physically. All it takes to kill somebody is to wish them dead. If you thought that, I wish that person dead. Well, who is there that can say that they've had pure thoughts in this matter? And so... The real issue down in verse 3, ye ask and receive not. I know today people consider that there's a lot of praying going on, but true prayer, prayer is spirit wrought. And I truly believe if the Lord directs us to pray according to the Spirit, it's answered exactly as the Spirit directs us to pray. The problem is most of the time what we call prayer isn't. Here it says, ye ask and receive not. Why? Because ye ask amiss. So there's some asking going on, but what we don't see is the motive of the heart. Why is it that we ask? Is it truly that Christ be glorified and that his honor and glory alone should be fulfilled? Or is it because in our sinful flesh, we desire certain ends and certain results? that it says here, ye may consume it upon your lusts. That's a strong word, but it means pleasures. It says, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. And again, we're dealing here with those who profess to be the Lord's. I say that, this very well relates not only to congregations in modern day Christendom, but it pertains even to our own congregation. And I know that offends some to think that here we are in a place where the gospel is being preached, and yet not everybody in attendance is necessarily the Lord's. And I know what that does. People begin to say, well, who he, who's he talking about? Does he think I'm the Lord's or doesn't he? It doesn't matter. I'm not here to judge. 
I just know that we all bring in with us when we come to worship this heart of adultery that left to ourselves, we would be prone to seek the friendship of the world, which is enmity with God. We will do the exact opposite of what the Spirit teaches us here concerning what it is to be Christ. And so he's addressing some of these that profess to be the Lord's. They, like Christ said of the Pharisees, you honor God with your lips, but your heart is far from, from him. And so here, whosoever therefore will be friend of the world is the enemy of God. I will tell you that in Christendom, there is a lot of worldly friendship. And it's evidenced by the way people want to bring their friends and they want the, their places of worship to be a friendly place and let's make it comfortable for everybody. Let's not preach about anything that's going to offend anybody. And so when it says here, who said they'll therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. That notion that somehow we can give up God's glory and that glory that he has purposed belong to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ alone, and somehow cater to men because they're friends, so-called, or their family or loved ones, and therefore we prefer their favor than what God declares is his favor, that is to set yourself as an enemy of God. It says here, do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? And it's talking about the spirit, it's talking about the spirit of man. It's not the spirit of God, but the spirit of man that is within us lusteth to envy. In other words, we do what we do because we're jealous of one another, but we're also jealous of our own reputation. We think about how many times we make choices based upon how we'll look in the end. And that is wrong. Now, here's where there's hope, because you read all this, and you think, wow, this is being addressed to a congregation or a group of people that profess to be the Lord's. It says in verse six, and I love this part, he giveth more grace. And that's what we need. Trust that when we gather for worship, we understand our need of grace. When the scripture says, grow in grace in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, you grow in grace by growing in your understanding of your need. And the more we see of Christ, the more we understand that need. The more I read even these few verses, the more I see the light shining on my own heart and it causes me to cry, Lord, give me more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. So in other words, it's great, the grace of God that humbles us. And as the grace of God humbles us, we desire more grace. Where you see any resisting what's clearly declared or revealed in this word concerning God, concerning the Son, concerning grace, concerning sin, where you find that resistance, that's nothing but a proud, hardened sinner in need of God's grace. Now, where he gives grace, we see in verse 7, there will be a submitting. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God, based upon him giving more grace. How is that grace evidence? It's when he brings us to bow, to acknowledge his glory in all things and his will in all things. Even if it goes contrary to our flesh, that's number one. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. Our lives are a life of resistance against him who is enemy number one of Christ. Christ, number one enemy. He has fought him from the beginning and will continue to do so until such time as he's cast into the lake of fire. He and his angels, but until then, there's a warfare. Now, how do we resist him? By not giving foot to him, 
by submitting unto God in all things, to rest in how God himself has declared that we should be righteous before him, and that is through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in so doing, it says he will flee from you. I will tell you the devil's workshop is working 24-7, not out in the world, but in places of worship where people gather, and according to them, it's to worship God, and yet all kinds of activity and things that are self-promoting going on, we are to resist that. We're to resist any kind of worship that does not give Christ all the glory. And then in verse eight, it says, number three, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. A lot of people like to read that and see, see, he's waiting on you to do the first step and then he'll do the rest. But it's all in this context where he gives more grace. That's how after we have to read it. We will draw nigh to God. And so draw nigh to him. Uh, drawing nigh to him, he does draw nigh to us. There's that drawing together. I've given you the illustration before of the ship coming into the wharf. And they throw that big old rope out there and they begin to pull on it. It's the ship that approaches the wharf. You might look at it and say, hey, the wharf's getting closer to the ship. It's a matter of perspective, but in reality, the wharf isn't moving. God doesn't move. So when it says draw an eye to God and he will draw an eye to you, that's where you will see and enter into his very presence with you because of that grace. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. That's the problem right there, double-mindedness. One time thinking upon God's glory and on the other thinking, I'm going to work something out, do it myself. Now to cleanse your hands you sinners, and purify your hearts means to look to Christ and Christ alone. That's the only place there's cleansing. Look to his shed blood, that which he accomplished for the cleansing, for the purifying of his people. And therein we rest. And it says in verse 9, be afflicted and mourn and weep. In other words, this matter of worship is not one of entertainment. We don't come together with the idea of having a good time. There is an afflicting, there's an there's a mourning and a weeping, and it's a double-edged sword. I know we're to rejoice in Christ, but at the same time when by his spirit, he causes us to see just to what point or degree we in ourselves are sinful. There is an afflicting, there is a mourning, there is a weeping. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. That is where we, by God's Spirit, see ourselves as we are. Humble yourselves in the sight of God, and he shall lift you up. Again, when it says humble yourself, that means each person individually. Don't be looking at your neighbor. Don't be pondering or thinking. I wonder what they're thinking at this particular time. Humble yourself. May I be humbled before the Lord. It's what it says, in the sight of the Lord. It's as if there's nobody else present when we worship, and he shall lift you up. We come with burdens. We come with a heart that is laden down in this flesh with sin. Where's the hope? Well, it's in the Lord lifting us up. How does he lift us up? Again, by his spirit giving us eyes to see Christ alone. Speak not evil one out of another, brethren. That's one of the first things that takes place when you get a bunch of sinners together, even for worship. It doesn't take much even after worship for somebody to say, did you see so-and-so today? Did you hear what they had to say? Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother speaketh evil of the law and, the, and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. Be careful not to set yourself up as a judge. And what if God should judge you with the very same law with which you desire to judge others? 
there'd be none that would stand. There is one lawgiver, verse 12, who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judges another? The real point here is that when we hear God's word set forth, that that light shine upon this heart, my heart, and not for us to be wanting somehow, okay, Lord, bring that home to so-and-so's heart because we know our own name. I often refer to being in a hospital. Let's say you're on the oncology ward. You're suffering from cancer and everybody else is suffering from cancer. How many people spend their time thinking, well, I wonder how they're feeling today. The main thing is, how am I doing? Is where I am and is the help I'm getting and is the physician I have one who could truly help me in this matter. And that's how we come before the Lord. Not thinking of anybody but ourselves. The neediest of all. That's why I don't worry about numbers. Who's here and who isn't. I'm thankful when God brings one sheep. And even myself being the neediest of all. So for that, our eyes are on Christ alone by his grace. You can see in all of this, it's selfish pride, it's being double-minded. This is where envy and strife enter in. But as the Lord gives us grace, we bow, even to the point of our projects for tomorrow. Verse 13, go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. We will. I will. That's our depraved nature to think that somehow we can direct others and we can direct ourselves. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor. Someone was telling me today about a preacher this past Sunday that they know stood up and preached, not a necessarily a gospel preacher that I know of, but stood up and preached and was feeling ill and uh, went to the house, tried to rest. They took him to the hospital, emergency room, and uh, complications developed. He developed sepsis, and by morning he was dead. And everybody was shocked. This is the man that stood and preached for a Sunday morning, and now he's gone. Well, that could be any one of us. I often think this may be the last time that the Lord enables me to stand before you and preach. None of us are exempt. This may be the last time that one of you sit there and listen. What is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For what he ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Notice it begins with, if the Lord will. <laughs> Even in that, we're, we're so unlikely to think of that. We, we state our projects and then we think, oh yes, uh, if the Lord will. How about if we started as scripture does? If the Lord will, and I don't care whether we're talking to brethren or we're people out in the world. What you got planned for tomorrow? Well, if the Lord will, what it is is a statement of submission to God's sovereign act in all things, his will. If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings, and all such rejoicing is evil. Notice how the scripture puts it right to the point. It doesn't say it's just a misgiving or a weakness. Even that shows double-mindedness. No, it's an evil. And it brings us to confess the rebellion of our own heart before the Lord, knowing that when we rejoice in our own boastings, it is an evil before God. It's rebellion. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and who can know it but those that are taught of the Spirit, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. It's an offense to holy God. Gracious Father, thank you for your word. I must say that in reading it, my own heart is humbled as I consider my own need.
before you pray that you would be pleased to draw my heart once again to the Lord Jesus Christ and all those here present. It's our greatest need at this hour. It's not for others more than ourselves. Even as Paul said, this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation. That Jesus Christ came to the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And so I pray that you would direct our hearts, prepare us as we hear your word preached. And above all, may our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be honored and glorified. We give you the thanks, praise, and honor in his precious name. Amen.